welcome everybody to this evening's <coughs> webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is a national webinar organised by the North of Scotland local group, so I'm going to hand over to them very soon. Um, but just a little bit of background. So these national webinars is something that the Scottish Wildlife Trust um, trialled during lockdown in collaboration with all our local groups, and they proved to be very, very popular. And we thought it would be interesting to see if post lockdown there would still be demand for this kind of event and clearly with the number of people that have signed up um, it definitely is something that people are still interested in taking part in and hearing about so we're very glad to have been able to bring it back in 2022. Um, just a tiny bit of housekeeping, uh, housekeeping for me before I hand over to the local group. So first of all because it's a webinar everybody that's attending is not going to be on screen it's just going to be as panellists but just to let you know that it has been recorded so that we can share it with a wider audience uh, potentially at a later date. Also, um, throughout the webinar, if you want to have any comments or if you just want to say hi and where you're joining us from tonight, you can use the chat panel at the very bottom. Um, please don't share any links through that just for security reasons, but anything else, if you want to say hello, if you want to make any comments or observations, um, any fungus stories that you might have, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, if you've got any questions for Liz that you want to be addressed at the Q&A after our talk, um, please put them in the Q&A panel. Um, and if you see that somebody else has submitted a question that you really like the look of, you can actually upvote that um, by clicking on the thumbs up. And then the most popular questions should rise to the top and then we'll try and address all of them first, um, depending on how much time we have tonight. So I think that's all I really have to say. So thanks again, everybody, for joining. And I'm going to hand over now to John Cromarty, who is the chair of the North of Scotland group. So over to you, John. OK, thank you very much, Jill. And uh, a very warm welcome uh, both to our North of Scotland group members and to the wider membership of Scottish Wildlife Trust who are joining us, joining us this evening for our first Zoom event of, of the autumn. We hope that you've all had a good summer and that you have been active not only in enjoying our wild places and our wildlife, but through your various individual contributions, also helping to extend our nature conservation activities for the benefit of future generations. Before handing over to Dan Poplett, who's our vice chair and who is a naturalist, a conservationist and an environmental educator, and we're very lucky to have Dan as our vice chair, um, He's going to chair the event and he will introduce our, our speaker for this evening. But just before I do that, I would like to pay tribute briefly to another naturalist, conservationist and environmental educator, namely Dr. Peter Tilbrook. It would be very difficult to do justice to the life and work of one of our best known local members who very sadly passed away in July. Whilst he lived in Cromarty, in the north of Scotland for 47 years, Dr Peter Tilbrook's nature conservation work achieved both national and international recognition. Following graduation in 1961, Peter was recruited by what became the British Antarctic Survey to develop a biological research programme in the South Orkney Islands, where he was based for two and a half years. He was awarded a prestigious Polar Medal in 1967 for his work which involved the identification of some species of invertebrates new to science, a number of which later bore his name. In 1975, Peter moved to Inverness to work for the Nature Conservancy Council as Deputy Regional Officer for Northwest Scotland. He was then promoted to, the, to a director role in Scottish Natural Heritage, now Nature Scott, enabling him to lead nature conservation in the area that he loved so much for 21 years. In no way did retirement deter Peter from his dedication to nature conservation. And among his many retirement activities, he undertook voluntary roles for a number of environmental charities, notably the Scottish Wildlife Trust, the John Muir Trust, for which he was a former trustee uh, during the time that Ben Nevis was taken into the John Muir Trust ownership. No coincidence, given Peter's phenomenal knowledge of Ben Nevis and that surrounding area, uh, which of course was part of his patch in his capacity uh, with 
Scottish natural heritage. He was also very active in many local organisations uh, in the north of Scotland, including the Murray Firth Partnership. Peter was a huge inspiration to so, so many throughout his life. His dedication to nature conservation and the environment made a difference for the future of wildlife and for our enjoyment of it. Our thoughts go to Peter's family, his wife, Fran, and his two daughters, Cathy and Georgia. So with that, I would now like to introduce Dan Poplett, our Vice Chair, and Dan's going to be introducing our speaker, as I say, and chairing the question answer session and discussion this evening. So over to you, Dan, thank you. Great, thank you, John. And evening, everyone. And I'm really delighted that we can have Liz with us this evening. And um, Liz Holden is one of Scotland's most respected mycologists and fungi have been a passion. She's studied for over 35 years, working in a range of habitats across the UK. And as well as being a very active field mycologist, um, Liz, and, Liz is an excellent educator as well and loves sharing a fascination in the identification, recording and ecology of all fungi. She's one of the founder members of the Grampian Fungus Group and has written a range of articles on fungi, including a series of leaflets for Plant Life Scotland. And I've had the good fortune of participating on one of her fungus ID workshops. And I was struck as well as by her enthusiasm, also her wealth of knowledge and her ability to communicate it in a really accessible and engaging way. So we're really glad to have you along, Liz, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Dan. That's very kind of you. That's grand. Um, just to say hello and uh, to welcome what I gather is quite a large audience, which is fantastic news. Um, I think there are, is an increasing fascination with the kingdom of the fungi. Um, and I was going to start by saying that living as we do um, in a, um, I better share my screen maybe, hang on. Living as we do in a, sorry, I'll just get this up and then I can prattle on properly. Um, there we are. Is that, come on. Um, living as we do um, in a country where, where fungi are actually thought to be generally rather bad news and people are very wary of them, don't understand um, all that much about them and very rarely would consider using them at all or even think about the fact that they might be fundamental um, to the well-being of our planet. Um, I, I take any opportunity to actually uh, try and redress that balance. And what I would hope tonight is that um, you'll go away with a little bit more understanding of the fungal kingdom um, and uh, you know, how it's so important and, and come away feeling a little bit more positive about fungi in general. Um, so what I'll do um, through the talk, I'll start by talking about how they impact in a very positive way on our entire planet and how they underpin the health of every habitat on our planet and of course indirectly that benefits humanity and then we'll go on and we'll look a little more um, at uh, some of the more direct ways that they have benefited, benefited people over, over the years. So I'm going to start with a little bit of fungal biology because without it you will not be able to appreciate just how extraordinary um, these, these organisms are. They are in a kingdom all of their own and the picture that you've got on your screen now, I'm sure you're all very familiar with, it's a fly agaric, Amanita muscaria. Um, and it's, it's, that's the image I think most people think of when they're thinking of fungi. It's um, these wonderful umbrella shaped structures that appear almost as if by magic overnight, and the autumn and I have to say this year they're they're behaving a little bit oddly and I think it might be something to do with the, the summer that we've had um, and it obviously does have an impact on them. Um, so um, a little bit about what it is we're actually seeing. Um, this is what we call the fruiting structure. Now we try not to use too many words that are associated with the plant kingdom because for a very long time fungi were thought to be members of the plant kingdom but we know now that they're not, they are different in many ways, and we'll touch on some of those ways as we go through the evening. So these structures that you see, and I should say as well that um, 
um, the fungal fruiting structures come in a whole range of different shapes and sizes and colors and textures. Um, and many of them are not visible to the, you, know, you can't see them without um, a hand lens. The vast majority, in fact, are what we call micro fungi. But the function of all of these fruiting structures is to enable the organism to reproduce sexually. And its sole purpose is to produce and release the things that we call spores, which are the tiny little fungal equivalent of a plant seed. Um, and those fungal spores are, are situated on the, I don't know if, uh, probably do it here. Yeah, there we go, on the underside of the cap. Uh, and these are the gills underneath the cap. And you'll be familiar with those on your shop mushrooms. All, almost all of those have gills under the cap. Whoops. And that's where uh, the spores are situated. So everything else about that is about protecting those spores and enabling them to be released. So the fertile part of that structure is there on a stipe up in the air currents. The top, which I've already described as umbrella shape, um, is there acting exactly like an umbrella. In, in very wet weather, it stops that fertile part of the organism getting soaked. And in very hot weather, it acts like a parasol and stops it drying out in, in hot sun. So everything that you see about all of these fruiting structures is about enabling the organism um, to reproduce with its spores. So that's all well and good. If that's the only thing this structure does, where's the rest of the organism? And that is a very good question. And what it is composed of is um, a network of filamentous cells, and they're not visible to the naked eye. So this enormous structure actually arises from a network of pretty much invisible filamentous cells that are in the soil in this case, and together they form something called the mycelium. And the mycelium. I'm very sorry to interrupt, Liz, but your your slides aren't moving on. I think it maybe needs to go into um, full. No, no, on. I'm still on this one. <laughs> I haven't sorry. moved yet. Apologies. It's, fine. it's okay. Thanks. Um, so this, sorry, now to. Um, OK, so that's an important concept to try and get your head round, and you will understand why um, as we do go on to the next slide. So one of the reasons that fungi are not considered plants is because they don't get their sunlight energy directly from the sun. Now, I'm sure most of you will know about the, the, the process of photosynthesis, which enables plants to get sunlight energy directly from the sun. We can't do that either. We, we can't get our energy directly from the sun. We have to eat um, things that have got their energy from the sun. So we get our sunlight energy indirectly. Um, and if you think about the food that you've eaten for dinner and trace it back, you'll realize that it either comes from plants or animals that have eaten plants. So fungi don't photosynthesize either. They're not green, they don't contain chlorophyll. And they have other ways of gaining their nutrients. And this is um, the, the really important thing to get your head around when we are thinking about the health of our ecosystems. Now, they have three very general ways of doing that. And I say that, um, that they're general ways because they don't read the books and they don't actually neatly form into these three categories. But on the left, you'll see uh, of the screen, you'll see I've, I've listed um, parasitic stroke pathogenic fungi, recycler fungi, symbiotic exchanger fungi, and these are called mycorrhizal fungi, so we can come back to that. Um, so I'll start with um, pathogens. Um, I think most people think fungi in their garden are bad news and that probably they're about to, to kill plants. A lot of people still think that. Um, and yes, they probably are a principal cause of, of plant death, but they don't just rampage through unless, and we'll come back to this, unless um, the normal checks and balances are not in place. So if um, a fungus comes from abroad, for instance. Um, right, I think I got as far as talking about uh, parasitic and pathogenic fungi. Um, and saying that a lot of people think that if they've got fungi um, around or in their woodlands, that it's actually bad news for the wood. Um, in actual fact, um, pathogenic or parasitic fungi will only get in, in the, in the general terms, in a wild wood, will only get into a plant um, or a tree 
when the fungal defenses of that tree um, are very uh, compromised. So if the tree is, say, droughted, or for whatever reason it's, it's um, been injured in some way, um, then it's easier for these fungi to get in. So what it's actually doing is actually weeding out the weaker plants and trees in a wild wood situation. So yes, it will, can cause the death of an old tree, um, and then that will create a, um, a dead wood habitat for other organisms, which we know are important, particularly in woodlands. And eventually that tree will fall down and create op an opening in the canopy, which will allow light in and the, the forest to regenerate. Now, some of these um, pathogenic fungi, uh, certainly in North America and the big um, forests in Russia, you can actually see the um, effect of these fungi from satellite images. And they're like enormous fairy rings of dead, fung of dead trees. And um, what happens is that the spores that I spoke to you about will germinate. You need two compatible spores. Each individual spore won't create a new individual. So you have to have two. And if they germinate and are successful in that germination, the mycelium that I spoke of, these, this network of um, filamentous cells, will actually um, travel through the forest floor and it will, um, it will kill the immediate trees around the point of germination. And then when it's utilized that food source, it will move on and it moves out and out and out. And that is what causes a fairy ring in grassland. It's the same principle. But in a, with a pathogenic fungus, like one of the armillarias in woodlands, it creates enormous fairy rings of dead trees. But in the center of that ring, the mycelium actually dies back and the fungus is no longer active. So young trees are able to regrow. And what we think is happening is that these fungi will work through in the wild wood. They'll just go right through the forest um, and then start again somewhere else. And the only thing might stop them is if they run out of trees or if they run up against another fungus in moving outwards in another direction. And then there's a kind of impasse. Um, so, you know, they're a perfectly natural part of our normal wildwood situation. It's only when you get uh, artificial situations where you've got single genetic um, strains of a particular tree or plant growing very closely together, they're likely to be the same age. Um, and if you get a, a fungal pathogen in there, it, it behaves without it completely unnaturally. It has no natural checks and balances. There are no resistant plants in there um, because once it's got established, if they're genetically more or less identical, the chances of there being a plant resistant to that um, is, is very small. So it can be a big problem. And um, it's something we need to be, I think, much more careful of is our biosecurity in this country. And something we'll need to be very aware of um, with climate change and um, things moving about, because without a shadow of a doubt, um, climate change will cause um, fungi to move uh, around the planet in response to that. But in the grand scheme of things, very few of our fungi are parasitic or pathogenic. The vast majority of them are either recycler fungi, um, litter and wood rotters, um, or uh, symbiotic exchanger fungi. So our lid, uh, litter and wood rotting um, fungi, the recyclers, are uh, absolutely crucial in driving the carbon cycle. And without them, we'd literally be buried under um, hundreds of meters of, of dead litter, plant litter and wood. Um, fungi, litter rotting fungi, are the only organism that can break down lignin. And that is the polymer that enables trees to stand up. It coats the cells and makes them very strong and enables trees to stand up straight in, even though they have this colossal amount of weight of wood um, within them. So uh, it's a, lignin is quite a difficult thing to break down. So the fungi get in there, break that down, and then they enable other organisms to get in um, and actually decompose the wood. So they are absolutely vital. Interesting comment, it's thought that back in the Carboniferous period, um, there is some suggestion that there were very few wood rotting fungi. And this is why these enormous um, 
deposits of, of coal were laid down because the wood wasn't being properly decomposed. So it was literally lying there and building up and building up and getting compressed and eventually turning into coal. So it's quite interesting. We might never get great big coal deposits like that again because uh, there was an absolute explosion of, of wood rotting fungi shortly after that period as they began to realize that there was a, well, that's realized is an morphic term, but they took advantage of the fact that there was this, this food available to them. So a lot of them are recycler fungi, and a lot more of them are what we call exchanger fungi. Um, and here it's important to understand um, that these filamentous cells um, that are traveling through the soil and they're feeding and growing and enabling those fruiting structures to be um, uh, produced. But what they're doing as well is literally growing around and into the tiny roots um, around all of our trees. Okay, and that enables an exchange of nutrients to take place. So the tree will give up to 15% of its photosynthesis, the photosynthesates, which are um, carbohydrates and sugars, will transfer that through that interface between the root and the fungal filamentous cell into the fungus. And in exchange, the fungus, which has been busy absorbing um, mineral salts from the soil that it's in, will give the tree mineral salts. And this is a huge advantage for the tree because the fungal mycelium can grow incredibly quickly. Um, a tree root can only grow at a certain speed and will very quickly utilize all the available nutrients immediately around the end of the root. But if you add a fungal uh, mycelial network onto those roots, it expands the ability of the tree to get mineral salts absolutely extraordinarily. If I say to you that in some circumstances, a teaspoonful of soil can contain hundreds, well, uh, kilometers, um, hundreds of meters, kilometers of fungal mycelium, if you put it all end to end, it's a colossal biomass in our soil. And I always try and stress that soil is one of the last habitats that we know virtually nothing about. Um, very little work. It's been so difficult to actually work out what all this stuff is, because even with a, a scanning electron microscope, it's difficult to actually pick up fungal mycelium. It, they are, they're so small, the individual cells. But DNA is beginning to unlock some of these secrets. And institutes like the James Hutton in Aberdeen um, are, are certainly um, paying a lot more attention now to the composition of our soils. And if you think of that enormous biomass of, of uh, mycelium in the soil, there's going to be things grazing on it. So it's going to be really important for soil um, biodiversity in general. Um, so over 90% of our planets, well over, probably almost all of them in fact, um, have some kind of mycorrhizal fungus partner. The only time that you don't actually get them so much, you will get some, but if you pour artificial fertilizer onto um, trees or cereals or crops or whatever, they don't need their mycorrhizal partners quite as much. And so they don't actually um, pick them up as much. They don't, you know, they are able to, to keep them at bay, if you like, so that they're not actually having to give any of their photosynthesis because they're getting enough um, mineral salt from the fertilizer. Um, but I mean, uh, fungi also provide water. They also provide protection from soil nematodes. And if we are going to run out of um, nitrogen, uh, phosphate and potassium fertilizers, uh, we are going to have to start thinking again about other ways of um, encouraging our, our crops to grow. So it's um, an interesting and absolutely crucial um, thing that fungi do for us is actually support all of our plants and trees one way and another. And they have almost certainly done this from the time that plants came out of the oceans um, as algae and um, club mosses, that it's very, very likely that it was mycorrhizal fungi that enabled sea organisms, sea algae, to actually um, flourish on land. So they've been around for a very long time. They just don't fossilize very well. So people tend to think they don't. So um, I'm hoping that everyone has seen that. Uh, that we've been able to change um, our slides. Yes. So just to, yeah, thanks. Just um, 
to give you some examples of some of these fungi, because um, there's nothing quite like actually having um, pictures of fungi to remind us what, the, what we th are thinking of. These are honey fungi. Um, this one here is Armillaria malaya. Now this is the one that gardeners really don't like in their garden because it's related to the fungus that goes through the forests in North America, the massive forests in North America and Russia. Um, that one is um, Armillaria ostoi. This is Armillaria malaya. Um, and uh, people ask me how you get rid of it if it's in your garden because it will kill um, shrubs and trees and it's very um, aggressive really and I say really the only way is to wait until it goes um, just grows out from your garden and into the neighbours and just keep quiet about it but I'm sure that's not really a very popular suggestion very difficult to get rid of once it's in your garden the one on the this one here is the bulbous honey fungus this one is much more much less aggressive much more of a recycler fungi and unfortunately um, certainly in the central highlands we get a lot of this honey fungus and not a great deal of that one which is nice. Um, this is one of our little um, recycler fungi. So the last ones were considered pathogenic or parasitic. So they are um, living off, or they are taking nutrients from living material of plants and um, so on. This is taking nutrients from um, already dead plant material and fungi will break down just about anything. So this one is this particular one, the wrinkled field cap, Agrocybe rivulosa, is growing on wood chips. Um, wood chips is a relatively new um, substrate for fungi. This fungus, which you can see is quite a big fungus, it's what, four or five inches tall. Um, this, this one um, was only recorded, was new to science in 2003, and it turned up in the Netherlands. And by 2005, it was on the south coast of Britain. And by 2007, we were recording it in wood chips in Scotland. Um, so this is a, an extraordinarily competent um, fungus at, at moving around. It's obviously very good at it. Not all fungi are, and we, know, we, we don't know a great deal about um, how long their spores are viable in the air currents. Um, a lot of them um, just don't travel very far, but this one is obviously a very successful colonizer and took full advantage of this wonderful new um, source of, of nutrients. Um, this one, this is one of our boletes. This, this particular one here is the orange birch bolete. Um, and you can see that instead of gills underneath the cap, this has got um, tubes. Um, can, oh, there we go. Yes, it was there. Um, you can see that underneath the cap, hanging down, that's sterile, that's support. There's nothing there. This is the fertile bit, and these are hollow tubes. And what you see are the, the pores at the end of the tubes when you look underneath the cap of boletes. The spores are all inside these tubes on little tiny cells. And again, they drop down, gravity pulls them down the tube and out into the air currents. Um, so this is a mycorrhizal fungus. Um, these ones always, as the name suggests, you always find them with birch trees. So this is one of our um, exchanger fungi. Um, there are a whole suite of fungi that grow. Um, some of them are very particular, will only grow with certain tree species. Others are what we call promiscuous and they'll grow with a whole range of tree species. But already you can begin to see that, you know, certainly our woodlands, but actually our grasslands too, are relying on these fungi to recycle nutrients, enable the plants to grow and keep them healthy. And it happens not only in our woodlands and grasslands, but the same fungal processes are taking place in deserts, in the sea, in fresh water, and even in the ice, there are fungi in the ice. So they really are underpinning the health of all of the habitats on our planet. And just to give you a little bit more of a window into that, this is a, a well-grazed pine woodland on D side. Now we think of a woodland as being um, a collection of individual trees. Now on the roots of each of these trees, there's going to be oh, at least two dozen different fungal individuals. Each of those individual fungi is going to be connected to the roots of different trees around about. So each of these trees is connected into a network of fungal mycelium. 
And it's got the name has been coined the Wood Wide Web. And we increasingly uh, research is suggesting that that web enables information to be passed through the wood and nutrients. So there's certainly research that suggests that um, if you get a, a hatch of aphids on one side of a wood, that information is somehow sent across the wood to the other side. So by the time the aphids have moved to the other side of the wood, the plants on the other side of the wood are already producing um, chemicals that will hopefully reduce the impact of the aphids on them. So that information has to get there somehow. And the suspicion is it is through this wood wide web. Similarly, if you have an animal die in one corner of the wood, a lot of those nutrients that go into the soil will be picked up. The, each mycelium will be sending out enzymes and they then absorb the nutrients that the enzymes release into each of those little filamentous cells, the hyphae, and that travels through the network, the mycelium, and it will be sent right through the forest. And certainly there's a suggestion, um, I, I often suggest as an example, if you think about the salmon runs in North America, and the bears are there hooking out the salmon on the sides of the river, and they take a mouthful and just throw them onto the side of the river, and that's where they, they, they lie and rot. And look what a wonderful way of getting the nutrients from the ocean into those woodlands through this wood wide web. So the fungi are absolutely everything um, that goes on on our, um, I don't know what is, and we really do need to know more about them. Okay, so that's, um, that's, um, that's, that's a sort of a very general look at why they're important for the planet. So more directly, in our country, we are not great eaters of fungi. This is a picture of a stall in Finland where they do eat their fungi, as you can see, in considerable quantity. It has to be said they've got a lot more woodland than we have. Um, and I'll talk in a bit about how I feel about collection of wild fungi um, for eating. Um, it's certainly not what everybody would approve of. Um, Okay, so a few of our edible fungi and a few of the ones you shouldn't be eating. This is St. George's mushroom. This is a spring mushroom. It grows in lovely big fairy rings in grasslands. And some people don't like it. It has a very mealy um, flavor and smell. Um, I think it's extremely nice. Um, this one is actually, um, I think everybody feels reasonably confident about identifying it. Although this is the chanterelle, Cantharella sabarius. Um, although it does have a lookalike. But what I would say is the reason you're seeing um, those um, big baskets of fungi on the side of the road and the reason why so many Eastern Europeans in Scotland are picking our wild fungi is because it is not possible yet, maybe it will be sometime, to actually grow a fungus like Cantharellus sabarius um, commercially. You can grow it, but you can't make it fruit. And we don't understand why that is. All the fungi you buy in the shops are recycler fungi. And I think that possibly the reason that we can't yet do the mycorrhizal fungi, because the chanterelle is one of the exchanger mycorrhizal species, all the ones you find in shops are recyclers. You can take a lump of wood into a lab and you can poke it and make it hot or cold or add carbon dioxide or whatever you want to until you find the thing that triggers your fungus to grow. It's much more difficult to take something like the wood wide web into a lab and push it and poke it. And I also think that they probably like everything sterile. And I strongly suspect that it is um, more than just a question of humidity or, or temperature that stimulates our mycorrhizal fungi to fruit. I rather think that there are other organisms involved, probably bacteria or even viruses, other microorganisms. So if you sterilize it, obviously you're going to lose all of those. Um, so quite an interesting um, thought that we can put a man on the moon, but we can't really make, we don't really understand why a chanterelle suddenly fruits or doesn't fruit. Anyway, that's a bit of an aside. So for those of you who are interested in these things, um, the fungus on the right here is a, a, a chanterelle. I would say organic egg yolk yellow, this is a false chanterelle, which gives some people upset tummies. Other people eat it quite happily, thinking they're eating chanterelles. 
Um, I always think it's definitely got a more orange hue. They've both got these lovely gills that run down the stem that fork quite a lot. You can see these are forking too. Uh, so they have a lot of characters in common. And if you don't see them side by side, they can be difficult to distinguish. Yes. These two you definitely um, should not be messing about with. And uh, I, it has to be said in this country, we have relatively few examples of fungal poisoning. Um, this one on the right is the destroying angel. And remarkably, some people mistake this for field mushrooms because it's, um, if you ever do anything at all learning about fungal education, you will know that one of the characters I speak about all the time is what color the spores are and the mushroom will have dark, violaceous black spores. Um, and you shouldn't make a mistake like that unless you're being very silly. But people do tell us um, was consumed um, relatively all time by uh, Nicholas or um, Orbin, the author of the Hall, about it after the event. They were very, very lucky. Um, the fungus was, was identified quite soon after they ingested it. They had obviously um, quite serious gastro, gastric problems. What they didn't realize was when, when the gastric problems die down, um, what's happening, in fact, is a different toxin is actually attacking your renal system. And that's what happens basically with both of these. Um, it's it's not the initial sweats and vomiting that are the, the killers, it's what's going on inside. So what's important is that you um, are able to know what you ate and they were able to take a specimen and um, it was picked up that it was Fortinarius rubellus and they were treated. But the guys, the, there were four people involved and the two men both had to have kidney transplants. It was a very serious and they were very lucky um, to survive. So there are very few of these very deadly fungi out there, but they are out there. Um, and if wild fungi, just for yourself, uh, you really need to know your fungus before you um, do um, take, take anything back and eat it. Um, morels, this is another um, interesting edible. It's considered highly edible um, and a delicacy. And in Scotland, we have a lot of this one which is the false morel, Gyrometra esculenta. And you would think from its name esculenta that it's actually a good edible fungus. Um, in Finland, I know that they eat this, but they uh, boil it, throw away the water, they boil it, throw away the water, boil it, and then eat it in soup. And occasionally what they were finding, and they don't actually keel over, but they were finding that sometimes the Cooks were very poorly and um, abroad at the same time that the American space program was running. And um, they obviously they, they took a lot of time to work out what was making their space engineers poorly in the program. It turned out it was the rocket fuel. And um, with, if you um, ingest it at all, it, it with stomach acids, it turns into, um, I should say that it was a rocket fuel that was making the astro the engineers ill but if you ingest this fungus gyrometra esculenta it reacts with your stomach acids and forms monomethyl hydrazine which is effectively rocket fuel and this is what was happening the cooks were ingesting the fumes um, as they were cooking it and obviously if you eat it without cooking it properly it's going to make you very poorly so these are the things you need to be aware of if you are going to use them as a food um, Interestingly though, uh, fungi are integral to almost everything that we eat. And I thought you might be interested to uh, go through a shopping trolley um, of sort of your, your average supermarket shopping trolley, more or less, um, and see what's left. If we take out everything that, um, that involves fungus at some point during its production, so we'll start, obviously we've got, um, we've got a tub of mushrooms here. Now, incidentally, uh, the growing of mushrooms is an incredibly big, uh, across the planet, a massive money-making industry. Um, it's one of the biggest food industries that there are. So we'll take out the mushrooms, we'll take out the yeast, because everyone knows that's um, 
a fungus. And uh, we'll take out the corn because corn is made from um, fungal mycelium, basically. It's one particular sort of fungus that they use. Um, so we'll take those out. Okay. And then we'll take out the bread and the cheese and the marmite and the soya. Bread, obviously, you make with yeast and, um, and wheat. And wheat, as I've explained, is mycorrhizal. It has a fungal partner and certainly would do in the wild, any of your wild wheats. Um, a soy sauce is uh, it's a fermented um, bean, and that uses a fungus. Two different sorts of fungus are used. A marmite is spent brewer's yeast, so that's clearly fungal in origin. We'll take those out. Um, and then flour. Well, as I've hinted when we took the bread out, flour comes from um, cereals, and cereals need fungi to grow. So we'll take, oh, did I take that out? What have I taken out? Oh, no, I took something else out first. Sorry. We took out the wine and the, the uh, beer and the whiskey. And all of those use different fungi during their, their fermentation processes. So they can go, go, go. And then the flour. Yeah. And then um, cakes and biscuits and uh, papadoms, obviously also all using different cereal flowers so they can go. Fruit and vegetables, potatoes, etc. They're all mycorrhizal. A lot of them these days will be supported on artificial fertilizers, but technically they're mycorrhizal plants, so they all go. And jams and marmalades, um, your cereals, your crisps, well, you can trace them back without any problem at all to plants that have um, been mycorrhizal. They've had fungal partners, we'll take them out. Okay, so what about all our cat food, dog food, meat products? Um, obviously, they, are, they come from animals, and the animals themselves don't actually need um, fungi, but they do eat crops that needed fungi to grow, so we'll take those out. And then we're left with uh, dairy. Well, that comes from cows, and actually not only does it come from an animal that eats grass that's mycorrhizal, there are actually fungi in the stomach of cows um, that actually help um, to digest um, the fungus, the um, grass in the cow's stomach. So fungi are very important for dairy products. Um, chocolate and fizzy pop now and coffee. You might not think they need it. Well, obviously coffee plants and cocoa plants are mycorrhizal, but they also use fungi in the um, drying process of these, um, these um, products. So the, the husks are fermented. And also when they, um, they use aspergillus in brewing, it produces, they can produce citric acid from it. And citric acid is what makes fizzy drinks fizzy. So we'll take all of those out. There's not very much left there now. In fact, when I look at it, it's a paper and um, toilet rolls um, and a bottle of water. And of course, toilet rolls and newspapers are made from essentially from wood, which comes from trees. And we now know they're all mycorrhizal. So we are effectively left with a bottle of water. And if that's a plastic bottle, you could probably chase that back and think that there was a fungus involved in the oil somewhere along the line. I'm quite sure. Um, but I think it just hopefully underlines just how much we use fungi in our foods on a day-to-day -day basis, probably without any um, realization at all, but they really are very important. Okay, and then another um, more direct way in which fungi have been useful to us, and I'm sure uh, you will know that um, Alexander Fleming um, accidentally discovered penicillin um, on one of his um, agar plates, and he realized that the actual fungus, which was um, just, a, a, it just got in by accident, um, was actually inhibiting the growth of the bacterium. And um, of course, um, it led to the development of penicillin and lots of other um, antibacterial medicines, anything with mycin or mycota in the name will have a fungal origin. The enzymes that are used in it will be a fungal origin. Also, um, statins, which are used for um, controlling cholesterol, and cyclosporins, which are used to suppress um, the body or to help the body cope with um, 
transplants. So uh, lots, I'm sure there are lots of other examples of fungi in medicines and the pharmaceutical use of um, an understanding of, of um, fungi is really big business. A little bit about, um, whilst we're still thinking about um, medical uses, this is a little bit of a historic um, use of a fungus. These are puff balls and the spore mass, the fertile mass is inside the ball. So it's lovely, well protected um, as these are before it's mature inside a, a sterile stomach, if you like, inside a little bag. And as the spores mature, the, that opens and you can see these are dark green and you will find the, the, when they're mature and dry, you can literally jump on them. They're designed to be dispersed either by animals knocking into them or raindrops puffing the spores out and small children and the big kids. I've seen everybody jumping on the puff balls, but that's what they're designed to do, puff the spores out. Now, I was told um, that in, all, in butcher shops, um, you would often find this one threaded on a, on a long thread and hung up. And when the butcher would cut themselves when they were preparing meat, um, they would actually puff the spores onto the cut and it would stop the bleeding. Now, I don't know that it's actually a styptic or whether it's just that the spores are the same size as the, the capillaries that are bleeding, but it obviously worked, which I think is rather a nice use because there's very, very few uses of our fungi in this country. And when we were doing some research for uh, the creating the English names for fungi, we actually went to native Gallic speakers on the islands and just to see if there were um, any Gallic words for our fungi that might you know, give us an idea about their uses. There's virtually nothing in the Gallic, very little. There are, there are some. Um, but not a lot. Um, it's very interesting. They form a very small part of our folklore, uh, medical um, folklore particularly. But this one I thought was quite interesting to hear about. So puffballs. Fomis fomentarius is one of the others um, that we have used. Um, these are what we call the hoof fungus or the tinder fungus. It's very common in Scotland on old birch trees. It's what we call a weak parasite. So it will um, infect old birch trees and then um, it will carry on then recycling them once they they are completely without defenses because most trees healthy trees have defenses against these um, fungi um, this actually the inside of this can be uh, um, scooped out and mixed with iron pyrite and you can light it and it will smolder for hours and hours and what they used to do would be to scrape out the inside of the bracket uh, mix it up and then you, you thread a, um, a thong or something, make a couple of holes in the top and you, you put the, um, the tinder inside the now hollow bracket, light it and you know you can swing it on your hook as you're wandering about and it's enough um, air to um, actually keep the smolder going until you need it to light a fire. So quite an interesting fungus that. It's also used um, uh, to make felt. And uh, this is a table decoration made from Fomis fomentarius. This is again in, in Finland, um, a rather attractive, and that's made from that hoof fungus. And you can make paper from them as well um, without a problem. Um, interestingly, the other bracket that grows on, on birch trees, the birch polypore, which is an annual, um, it just grows in one season. Um, they use that, they, it's very light, and they use that to mount insects in the Natural History Museum. Their insect collections are in little squares of that fungus. And it's partly because it holds the pin well, but it also, that fungus contains an antibiotic and an anti, a sort of an insecticide. And it actually helps to keep those collections in good condition. And Utsi, who you may have heard of, the Iceman, who was found in a glacier um, on the Austrian, the Austrian border or the Italian Alp, Alps border, Italy, Germany, I think. Um, he was carrying um, tinder made from Fomis fomentarius in a pouch, and he had um, a big segment, a big block of the other fungus, the other birch polypore, um, which he carried with him. We don't know why, but we wonder whether um, the antiseptic qualities of that fungus were known and it was a bit of a either a, a part of his medicine kit or 
I don't know, maybe a good luck charm to keep him in good health. It clearly didn't work, but um, if that was the case, but we'll never know. So it's quite fun just to, to wonder, but that, as I say, that other fungus does, the birch polypore has uh, antibacterial, antiseptic qualities. So here's another hat made from um, the Fomis fomentarius. And then this hat is obviously wool, but that's been dyed using fungi. So here we are back in fin uh, Sweden this time. And these are people that have um, taken, they've collected fungi that are suitable for dyeing wool. And apparently you can't dye cotton with it. It has to be wool. Um, and they make all sorts of wonderful colored hanks of wool. And you can see here, beautiful um, colors and greens in there. You can get a blue, um, but obviously they hadn't found that in the fungus that they needed. Um, this is one of our, uh, this is called Dyer's Maize Gill, Faeola schweinitzii. It's one of the fungi um, that we have frequently. It grows at the bottom of, um, of conifer trunks. Um, it's a, a parasitic fungus, a weak parasite. So you, your tree is obviously a little bit old if it's got one of these. Um, but the tree could carry on for decades after this fungus is, is growing there. Um, but it will give you, depending on the mordant, this fungus will give you yellows and ochres, tans and rusty browns. And here's some other sorts of fungi that will give you good, good colours. These are what we call webcaps, they're Cortinarius species, and they'll give you greys and yellows, reds, pinks and purples. A lot depends on the mordant you use, and almost any fungus will give you um, some kind of colour. So that's quite a fun way of using them. And uh, really just to finish on a bit of a magical note, it's a fairy ring. And of course, we all know how they're formed by the fairies doing a dance in the moonlight. Um, and these uh, little guys, lots of folklore surrounding them. None of it particularly, well, I say not good. This has a, this contains a very um, a, a psychoactive um, component and um, causes all sorts of weird effects and hallucinations, definitely not recommended. It's quite like LSD in its effect, uh, but obviously unmeasured doses. Um, but it was very popular amongst the laps and um, some of the hallucinations it can give you are, are connected with flying. And if you think about the reindeer, um, the shaman used to take this to fly up the chimney and go and visit the spirit world and come back with gifts of knowledge. And I think you can probably, this, this, this information kind of did the rounds of the Victorian uh, naturalists at the time. And I think it's perhaps no coincidence that uh, Father Christmas suddenly started being a red coated gentleman with, with uh, white beard and white trimmings because originally he was green. So um, that's quite an interesting little story that comes with that one. Um, I hope that's given you a little bit of information about what fungi are and why they are so important. I haven't touched on any of the, um, the developing ideas that there are with, um, with fungi. People are looking, people like Paul Stamets are looking at um, cleaning uh, polluted lands, land sites um, using fungal mycelium. There are um, packages, packaging made out of um, fungal mycelium, and I'm told building materials beginning to be developed using fungal mycelium. So I think that there is a lot of potential um, for use in the future um, for fungi. And obviously, you know, we need to know a lot more about them and how we live successfully with them so that we can continue um, to have a healthy planet. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say just now. Um, I, I'm not sure whether there are many questions, Dan, and um, whether I should just stop screen sharing. Should I perhaps? Um, yeah, that's, there's a, a few questions, a couple of questions come in. And um, yeah, thanks so much for that, Liz. That's, I find that really fascinating. And one, one of the questions we've got here is from Anne, who is asking, um, about the wood chips that you mentioned, have they been imported and could spores have come in on the wood chips? Um, that's a, a nice question. I, I don't think so. Most people use local wood chips. Um, it certainly doesn't explain why this was new to science in 2003. You know, it came, I mean, where on earth was this fungus and how did it suddenly appear? 
Um, it's a big fungus um, with big features. So, it, but it is yes, that that is a possible explanation. Um, yeah, I think I think that doesn't fully explain this rapid, um, you know, spread of the fungus. But certainly, um, you could bring it into um, another garden and spread it that way. Yeah, yeah. Great, thanks. And um, Robert's asking, um, which fungi is found on tree trunks? Um, that was is used to clean open razors. Oh, that's the that's the birch polypore, the razor strop fungus. Yeah, and what they used to do is you you would take a slice of the fertile surface when it was still fresh, and you you would rub a uh, very fine silver sand into it, and then you mount that onto a board, and then you've got something that you can strop your razor on. So the razor strop fungus, it's, it's, it's now called Phobitopsis betulinus, but Piptopora betulinus is what it will be, the birch polypore. So he's absolutely right. There is a fungus that was used by the Victorians to do that, or anybody with a cutthroat razor. Great. And um, Cameron asking, if the wood wide web is broken, perhaps by digging, how quickly does it grow back? No, oh, now that's a question. I think if it's if there's a, a pipeline that goes through, say, and the soil goes back in, then I think it would recover probably pretty quickly. Similarly, if you were to put a path through a woodland, um, my experience of that is that the fungi do recover. Um, it depends on a number of things. Obviously, if you've got um, a lot of foundation in your path, that might not actually help. Um, the fungi might not go across the path what when it's a problem is when you repeatedly plow um, or, or dig up repeatedly um, and that just seems to um, chop everything up to such an extent that it doesn't recover does that does that make any sense i mean if you think about um bread when it goes what you know anything that goes an apple the the fungal mycelium grows incredibly quickly through that substrate you know once it's in there it will just go through it in a matter of hours sometimes if the conditions are right and that's one of the advantages that it is for trees to have fungal mycelium on their roots the fact that the mycelium can respond to changes very very quickly so if it's a single event i don't think the fungi would have very much difficulty in in growing across that but it does depend on on the size of the of the of the um, intervention and the regularity of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that does make sense. Yeah, thanks. And uh, Patsy's asking, does the destroying angel grow in a fairy ring form? Um, not usually, because it's mycorrhizal, um, so it's usually tethered to tree roots. Um, so it it would normally grow with um, uh, birch trees. That's its preferred host or partner. Uh, so you would you might find it in an arc where it's following the edge of the tree roots, but it's not quite the same as the fairy ring. The fairy ring in the photograph is um, is a saprotroph, a recycler fungus, and most parasites um, are re in a sense recyclers. They're going outwards, whereas a mycorrhizal fungus um, is usually tethered to its tree, um, but it will form arcs sometimes. Okay, and. Mike is asking, how important are fungal, fungal mycorrhizae as a carbon sink and for arable cropping, if chemical fertilizers are used, which reduce the incidence of mycorrhiza, does this reduce the amount of carbon sequestration? I don't honestly know the answer to that, but I think it's a really interesting question. Yeah. Um, a really interesting question. Yeah. Uh, they are taking carbon, I'm just trying to think that one through. They are taking carbon from the plants so they would be acting as a sink. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a really, really interesting question. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I don't know the answer to it. Uh, but I would say, yeah, it is making a big difference. Mm. Yeah. Need to think about that one. Great question. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. It's, and Gordon's asking, is there anything we can or should be doing in our gardens to promote the growth of fungi? Um, yeah, be careful. Um, some people like to um, use my, my, um, mycelial inoculum if they're putting in new plants. You can do that. Um, I worry a lot about that because they were they they use a lot of the what we call the endomycorrhizal species, which you never see because their whole life cycle is in the soil. 
And when they started with mycelial inoculum, they, they, at that time, they thought that these things were across the planet, maybe only 120 species, but they were looking at the wrong kind of um, definition of species with this group. So in fact, there are a lot more. And so taking these fungi from abroad, which at one time was being done, is, is, is bringing in fungi that shouldn't be here. So be careful of the provenance if you do decide to use mycorrhizal inoculum. Fungi in general um, seem to do well without fertilizers. Certainly um, if you've got a lawn, don't fertilize it and take the clippings off. And if you keep a lawn like that, doesn't matter about the moss, moss is all green after all. Um, I call them eco lawns, they're um, economic to manage and ecological by nature. And if you do that, if you don't fertilize and if you take your clippings off, um, you should get fungi in your lawn increasingly after 10, 15 years. And old lawns of some of these big old houses are some of the richest habitats for the wax cap grasslands that we have. So um, a, a nutrient poor short sward, if you've got lawns, is fantastic. Um, bright green lawns, not so good. So don't be too tidy. That's the other thing to say. Um, have a little, if you've got a damp corner, um, have a log pile. Um, that should be that should give you all sorts of interesting recycler fungi. Um, it shouldn't encourage anything dangerous in because the wood is already dead. So you're just getting recycler fungi in there, which are fine. Um, yes, yeah, so that sort of thing. Does that does that answer? Yeah, that sounds. That's. Um, I was just thinking as you were speaking. It's I often hear things about ways to promote other kind of other organisms in the garden, which is all which is fantastic, like insects and wildflowers and things. I don't tend to hear as much about fungi, so it's great getting that advice. Yeah. Um, and it's Nigel saying, hi, thanks for a great talk. Is there a good app that you could recommend to help identify ver various fungi? Oh, um, there are apps. I'm afraid I don't use them. As you've probably gathered, IT is not my strength. Um, there certainly is an app out there. Ugh, I should know the name of it, but I've never used it, so I don't know. You will get a lot of information, helpful information. If you Google um, Scottish fungi, and not the uh, not the Nature Scott one, it's the Google, um, it's called, I think, Scottish, uh, it's either Scottish fungi or Scottish field mycology. There's lots of great information there about how to go about identifying your fungus. And I would say be very, very careful because you, you do need to, to work through the characters properly. Don't just flick through the books looking at pictures because they never look like the picture in the book and you will miss the important characters. Um, so um, ha books are great, but you know, read the introduction, know what the important characters are. Um, and uh, there's a lot of information to help you with that on that website, the Scottish Fungi website there. And also information about local recording groups if you do want to get a bit more involved and going out with people who are experienced is probably the very best way um, to start um, identifying things. And then when you get a bit more confident, then um, go on to using an app or something. That, I'm sorry, I can't give you the, the app. Somebody else might know, I don't know. Okay, thanks. And um, a couple of people asking a similar question um, about how deep in the soil do the mycelium go to? Does it stay near the surface? Um, again, that's a good question. They are at different depths. Um, so you get a fungi functioning, a litter rotting fungi functioning at different depths. Some are right at the surface. Some are um, in the, the next layer down and then others are in the deep litter layers, you know, quite well down in the soil. I think probably mycorrhizal fungi tend to I think again it varies, but they won't be desperately deep. They will be at the surface and in those 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 top layers of the of the surface, I would think. But it will depend a bit on the roots of the tree as well. So yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, something you mentioned before as well, um, collecting fungi from our native woodlands. Are you for or against? Oh yes, I was going to say. Um, I have no problem with people taking for the pot. As far as we know, um, it is, you know, and, and uh, quite a lot of research has has been taking place, you know, looking at, at, you know, what happens if you walk on a boardwalk and you just pick every mushroom that pick, you know, that grows, you just pick the lot and then you have a control plot where nothing is done. And then you have another plot where you walk up and down all the time and um, it, picking didn't make any difference, but walking up and down did. 
Now, whether that's compaction of the mycelium or whether it's a destruction of the, the tiny immature fruiting bodies isn't clear, but picking a mature fruit body in the same way as picking a blackberry from a bramble doesn't actually damage the bramble. Having said that, I'm not altogether comfortable with people going in and stripping out everything. Um, if it's done sensibly, I don't have a problem with it. But what you do see is that, you know, people who don't really know what they collect, they just collect everything. And then they, you know, they leave, they, they'll, they'll clean them and dump all that at the side of the, of the car park. And then they'll take them to somebody else who then throws away the stuff that they don't want. And that's a shame. I, I think if you're stripping out like that, you're removing a food source for invertebrates. You are, of course, removing the spore source. Um, in Scotland, I think that's possibly not such a problem because we have got um, an awful lot of ground and not that many pickers. Um, in other parts of the UK, it is an issue, um, you know, where the woodlands are quite isolated and um, yeah, people are going in and stripping them out. It, it's potentially a problem. But the other thing is it removes them for other people to enjoy and people get a lot of pressure from seeing these things in the autumn. So um, I think if it's done sensibly and if you just, for me, I would take maybe a few just enough to have on toast. I don't have a problem with that at all, but um, you have to be sensible about it. And it depends where you are in the country, I would say as well. Great, thanks. And um, Joe asking, is it possible to encourage the growth of puffballs, we get them in an undisturbed area of our garden and always eat a few, but leave the uh -huh. rest to encourage further growth. Um, um, no, I would, I, I honestly, it's like, I, I don't know what makes puffballs fruit. <laughs> it depends which ones. Some of them are wood rotters and others are mycorrhizal. So it depends which ones you've got there. Um, if they're wood rotters, obviously they will need wood to continue. You know, they'll need a supply of wood to keep going on. Um, but it sounds as though they're probably grassland ones. So I would think just keep your grassland as you've got it now. If they're growing, some years you'll probably get more than others. Okay, great. And um, Daphne asking, can fungi su survive prolonged drought? Uh, the my mycelium does quite well, yes. Um, undoubtedly, uh, some... You will get different species in the desert, so you get podaxis and things in the desert. So there are fungi in the deserts, but different species. Puffballs and um, other geastrums are actually very well adapted to drought situations. So there will be some species that would do fine and other species that probably will not do so well, and they will move on to other places where the conditions suit them better. Okay. And Sue is asking, if we are planting lots of saplings to reforest areas, will they survive without their associated fungi? <laughs> um, the, depends. If you're, if you're planting adjacent to existing woodland, then that's going to transfer root to root and spore rain, and you should get a good diversity fairly quickly. If you're planting a field um, with no woodland around, um, what you might get, you will get some... Um, uh, there's what we call pioneer mycorrhizal species, lacarias, and some of the cortinarius and some of the suius. Um, but you won't get diversity, um, and it will take a very long time for that to build up, a very long time. And uh, the problem is a lot of people put a great big dollop of MPK in when they plant. I, don't, I think sometimes in poor soils, a tiny little bit's not a problem. If you put a big dollop in of, of fertilizer, what happens is that the, the sapling shoots up and then it runs, it hasn't needed to ad adopt any mycorrhizal fungi, but when it runs out of MPK, if there's nobody running around putting more on, it just dies. You know, it will shoot up and then die. And that, that does happen quite a lot with young tree plantings. So you can try my mycorrhizal inoculum, but the same um, caution applies um, as I mentioned in the garden, just, just check the provenance of your, your, your mycorrhizal inoculum. And I would suggest that's probably a good thing to do because they don't only exchange nutrients. As I say, they, you know, once they're established, they will protect tree roots from nematodes and other grazing organisms. And they will also bring up water, make water available for them. So 
yeah, there, it's definitely a good thing to have mycorrhizal fungi there. And the normal way would be that the wood moves like an amoeba. So normally, you know, it would grow on the edge or in a clearing where, you know, the, for whatever reason, the canopy's opened up. So there would be an abundant source of adjacent mycorrhizal inoculum from the tree roots next door. So you are planting into somewhere where there are no neighbours, no tree neighbours. It, it is a bit of an issue. But there are, as I say, there are a few that obviously do very well from just spore rain. Um, but they certainly won't give you diversity. Right. And um, Tamara asking, in relation to cattle, does the fertilised silage seepage from feeders also damage fungi? Um, so again, some fungi actually are very, will do well in heavy, heavy areas, but no, uh, generally it's not good. For mycorrhizal fungi certainly won't thrive with that. Uh, there are a limited number, there are a few fungi that do very well in, in high nitrogen, very nitrogen rich environments, but mostly, mostly not. Mm. Right. And Mike is asking, why do you think that in the UK fungi have had such a bad press and they're not? Um, I really don't know. It's I don't know. Um, it's interesting because you know you you know the temptation is to say oh well the druids used them and when Christianity came it drove the use you know that positive use of fungi out. I don't think it's quite like that because you know the the countries in Europe like Italy and Spain um, are big Catholic countries and they love their fungi. I'm really not sure, and if anybody has a definitive answer, there's been a lot written about it, but I don't, I've never heard a convincing argument. Parts of Germany are very mycophilic, uh, phobic as well, um, and parts of uh, Denmark, but um, I don't know. I mean, the Vikings used them um, to get themselves revved up for a raid. They used Amanita muscaria, so I'm told. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it is an interesting question, isn't it? Yeah. And. Um, and Cameron asking, related to the question about um, collecting, if you are collecting fruiting bodies, what proportion should you take or leave? <laughs> well, again, that's a difficult one, because if you take half and leave half, then the next person comes along and takes half. I would say take what you need um, for your meal and leave the rest. Take yeah. what you need. Take as the, You don't need to take very much. I, know, I mean, that is something, I mean, when you're learning about them, you do have to collect them really to get up close and personal. There's a lot you can do without, but really and truly, if you're serious about identifying your fungi, you do need to look very closely at them and feel textures and smells. And often you can only do that by handling them, so. Right, yeah, yeah. And you mentioned before about invertebrates um, yeah. needing will, them as well. And yes. other things as well, like um, squirrels and deer yeah. and mice. Deer, and all all, yeah. It's yeah. A quite an important and quite a nutritious food source for um, invertebrates and mammals in as you're coming towards winter. Yeah, and definitely squirrels love them and the deer. The stalkers used to say they found boletes in the, when they were growling the deer in their stomach. So deer definitely eat them as well. Right, yeah, yeah. And um, Andrew mentioning an app called Shroomify Right. Um, um, Kenny Taylor's asking, in ancient woodland, could some mycelia be as old as the oldest trees? Yeah, I don't see why not. Um, they, I mean, it won't be exactly, you know, it will be constantly regenerating, but um, you know, it's like they say those huge fairy rings of dead trees are some of the oldest organisms on the planet. And the biggest, not one humongous fungus, ancient humongous fungus, but the mycelium is, is one genetic individual that's been there for thousands of years, just working its way through and then going back the other way and just round about. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't see why not, which is a, a lovely idea. Yeah, yeah. And Liz is asking, we've got a few more questions in a bit. Yeah, so we'll wrap up pretty soon. But um you talked about the fungi being in many environments. What about Arctic, cold, icy places? Yeah, they're there. They're, they're, they're functioning differently there because obviously the food supplies are different, but there are fungi there. Yeah. And then um, Melissa asking, would it not be better to plant mycorrhizal fungi alongside, I think she's meaning with like the spores with young trees? Yes, you can do that. But as I say, just... Um, I. I mean, you can, we've tried trans, 
transporting soil when a when a site is going to be built or you know or a road widening and we've tried you know moving soil with seedlings and that's definitely a way you can do it you can translocate that way but i've no idea how successful it is because of course they didn't pay us to follow up but um we did the translocation and you know we don't really know um some people have had some success um transferring grassland fungi that way but uh, you know it's it's like many of these things it's still very small scale um but yeah with all the caveats that i said about you know having native species you can buy fungal mycorrhizal inoculum which basically is is, is spores and mycelium um, but yeah you have to make sure its provenance is good yeah yeah and uh, i'll sneak in a very brief one i'm curious do you have a, a favorite either species or even family or anything Oh, I, I really enjoy working with something called corticioids, which are the little crusts you find when you turn over dead branches on a damp forest floor and it looks like a, 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 someone's had a paintbrush on the underside. They're great fun. I really enjoy working with them. They don't look and you never know what you're going to get till you put it under the microscope. And the, the European expert said it's like Christmas every time you look at them because right. uh, you just don't know what you're going to get. It's like opening a present. So, yeah, I agree with him. It's, it's great fun. Brilliant. Great. All right. That's um, thanks very much, Liz. That's been really, definitely for me, um, absolutely fascinating. Actually, so um, I've really enjoyed that. And I and thanks to everyone also for your your questions. And I'll hand over to John just now for a, a final vote of thanks. And yeah, thanks again. I'm really glad you could join us. Okay. Thank thank you very much, Dan, and many thanks indeed to you, Liz, uh, on a number of counts. One of the things I guess that always interests me about experts on any subject is how quickly they can convince their audience just how much we still have to learn and, uh, and, and to whet the appetite of the audience. And you certainly very quickly achieved that with your presentation tonight and got us to the conclusion that in spite of your own considerable knowledge on the subject, we all have a great deal to learn uh, about fungi. And you touched upon many aspects, I think, of fungi tonight that, that probably many of us were unaware of. The title of your talk uh, was, What Have Fungi Ever Done For Us? Well, you clearly answered that question comprehensively in that it's rather a lot, um, serving crucially important symbiotic relationships uh, with most of the foods on which we are dependent. We clearly, we have a lot to learn, uh, your message that we're a relatively inexperienced nation in terms of the culinary use of fungi is, I think, a very important one. And that contrasts with other countries where there's much more uh, fungi gathering and much more use by individuals of fungi in their cooking. So we need to learn a lot more about identification before sampling any fungi with which we are less familiar. Uh, so uh, you fungal foragers out there uh, learn thoroughly and learn carefully, uh, and please pay heed to Liz's very sensible advice. Um, we all have a go at it, and uh, those of us who are still surviving uh, are those of us who stick to those that we know only and seek advice in any that we don't without sampling. Finally, uh, I would just like to say thanks also to Jill Hatcher at uh, SWTHQ, and thanks to Dan for chairing the event and fielding all the questions. And to you, the audience, for your interest and your wealth of questions, uh, which Liz so capably stimulated uh, amongst a very large audience tonight. So thank you all very much indeed. Just before closing, I'll take the opportunity just to highlight what's coming up in the remainder of our autumn programme very briefly. On Wednesday, the 5th of October, Fairly Kirkpatrick Beard will be addressing the subject of drought in Scotland brackets really question mark on Wednesday the 2nd of November we have a presentation from Bob Lawton on catchment management on the river Findhorn and on Wednesday the 7th of December we have a presentation from Donald Shields uh, on conservation and the future of freshwater water mussels in Scotland and that evening we will also have our traditional Christmas quiz uh, following on from Donald's presentation. So that's what lies ahead in the coming three months. Uh, meantime, I wish you all a very good evening. Thanks very much, Liz, and thanks very much to the audience for your participation, and I wish you all a very good night. Cheers now. Bye.